start with a bit of an introduction to Aino 4, if you could tell me, give me a bit of an introduction to your band. Uh, sure. Uh, we formed in, uh, I think it was 2012. Um, uh, Ryan and Jan had been playing music together uh, in a different band. I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, was it? Uh, <laughs> That's going back a bit. <laughs> I know I'm trying to remember which one it was at the time too. It, oh, yeah, I think it was not even the rain, right? Because we were talking that's about right, yep. about how, yeah whether we should kick our friend out of the band or not, and that's that's how that's how we met Layla actually because she overheard <laughs> us talking about it. Yeah, I met these guys at a bar after uh, watching a comedy show of our mutual friend uh, Alex Lindo, who uh, used to be in Botanist and is uh, now in For Leeson. Um, and I just interrupted their conversation about uh, their, old, their, their band problems. And uh, I was actually at that time not, um, my bands were pretty much on hold at that point. So I was sort of hungry for a new project and listening to these guys talk about what they were doing just sounded really interesting. Um, you know, with the violin and the synths and um, the electronics, it sounded like something, um, you know, that I wanted to get involved with. So uh, luckily they asked me to jam and the rest is pretty much history. <laughs> we were all living in the Bay Area at the time. I think San Francisco specifically. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, it's way back, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, nine years ago, almost nine years ago. <laughs> it's crazy, it's been that long, yeah. <laughs> So in the 2012, what was uh, like the idea behind? Did you have like a clear vision of what Iron of Horror should be? I don't think so. I think it just kind of happened organically. Um, I knew I wanted to do something with strings and, and trumpet. And since that was sort of, um, you know, had, had some kind of uh, cinematic ambience uh these guys wanted to get into something a little darker which which i'm all about anyway um and i think it just it just uh took its own course and became what it is yeah, yeah, yeah back I'm, then we oh, were yeah go ahead sorry yeah i was just gonna say back then we were sort of like almost kind of electronic indie stuff and we both really wanted to do something a bit more darker and more atmospheric and so when we met later we were like we we have to do this. We have to convince her to to join us. And yeah, I mean, we didn't really know what it was going to be, but we just had some jams and some really good stuff came out of it. A lot of which made it onto the first album. Yeah, that's right. We uh, we did get together in person more at the beginning. Uh, Jan and Ryan had a studio and we'd all get together and just record our practices and take them home and just uh, work on stuff on our, you know, at home remotely and track more stuff at home and kind of uh, shape it that way until we uh, came out with our first album through Light Fractures in 2013. I mean, originally, I mean, we always kind of wrote independently, which um, was really helpful as we kind of ended up spreading out across, <laughs> across the world later. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't until a while where we actually then started playing um, playing out, which was then kind of weird because we'd written all these, I mean, in some ways kind of tape music, like things that we couldn't really do live. And so we would have to retranslate what we were writing kind of for a, a live um, element, which was actually a really interesting kind of um, way to look at music rather than writing to play it live. We were kind of writing whatever we wanted independently um, and then kind of sharing everything. And then later going back and kind of retranslating things for sort of a, a live performative um, component. So yeah, it was kind of, it was, it was a very different sort of approach to, to being in a band than, than I'd certainly kind of done before. But I think that was part of the, part of what was kind of interesting about it too, which is the process was, was, was pretty novel. Yeah. You mentioned the cinematic ambient. Uh, so what actually are like the building blocks to your music and where does the inspiration come from? I think Jan said it perfectly in a quote that we released that uh, 
hearkening back to the soundtracks of, of uh, the old days, like mid 20th century kind of stuff. I know for me, like a Neo Morricone was, music is, is a big inspiration, especially with the trumpet playing, that sort of spaghetti Western, uh, very epic kind of, um, you know, not complicated melodies, but just very, just sort of open and uh, expansive kind of melodies. That's how I think about it. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. um, no, go ahead, Yannick. No, who are you, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> are you, like, you're probably gonna say something better than me and it's just gonna make me look bad after, but um, I mean, I think we kind of approach each album and each song sort of because there's so much texture in kind of the stuff that we write, I think things a lot of times start off with kind of a, a, a kind of a tone and a feeling. Um, and sometimes, especially with this last album, kind of more of like kind of a palette in mind. And we sort of, you know, sculpt this, sculpt it into, into songs. And sometimes they're kind of traditional sort of strong structures, but a lot of times, I mean, I think this album again is kind of an example where the songs are this structurally sort of more, Kind of cinematic by design but i think to me like I, I think of it very kind of sculpture like sculpturally like starting with this like big tonal sort of blobs and then kind of layering on and i think i mean for me a lot of times the melodic components of it come later as they kind of we kind of weave them into sort of the the background textures that we've created yeah those initial building blocks they i think we try and have like two or three songs start started by each person so that that fingerprint is on it. And yeah, just to have them, I don't know, they can be sort of what you might expect. They might be the first ideas of a melody. They might just be like Ryan says, the blobs of a tone. And it's quite a, kind of nice when they're a little bit provocative and they kind of take, they kind of lead the song down a new direction we didn't think of before. Okay, okay. So going to the new album, the, how, how do I say this, Nels? <laughs> okay, so how do you see this new album like a uh, part of the evolution of your music from, as you said, the true light fractures that came out already in 2013? So how does the new album fit to the timeline? Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we got a little ambitious as we were uh, working on our second and third album. and. Um, these guys pretty much taught me how to record at home because I really wasn't doing that much. Um, I started my solo project around the same time we started this band and I really didn't know anything. And, um, and then Ryan and Jan got me hooked up with Ableton and that's, that's the, that's what we use, um, for, uh, recording and mixing and, uh, so I think like as the second and third album unfolded, it got really ambitious, layering with tons and tons of tracks, lots of electronics, lots of drones kind of operating under all the melodies. And, and at one point I was like, why don't, why don't we just challenge ourselves and write something with a lot fewer layers and see what happens and try to maybe uh, use use more, focus more on acoustic instruments. Um, uh, it, not completely, there, there are definitely electronics on Nels, but, but just kind of strip it back a little bit and uh, see if we can come up with something that sounds just as, uh, you know, refined and complete as, as the previous albums. I think this one more than, and I don't know, it would be interesting to see if you guys agree or dis disagree with this, but it seems like this one we had sort of from the outset, sort of an idea of how we wanted to approach it. Whereas the other albums kind of, I feel like we just, they kind of formed themselves as we sort of wrote them. But this one, you know, like Layla said, she had this idea from the beginning, like, what if we approach it like this? And each of us kind of took that in a little bit of a different direction and kind of interpreted that in their own way, which I think you can hear in the tracks, but it was, it was definitely kind of a more, a little bit more kind of restrained and defined from the onset than, than our other albums have been. Yeah. It's a little more definite, like say more with less, I think was how I approached it. You know, instead of writing a part to just add on to the song, if there's something that you didn't like about that song, sort of take a step back and kind of work out what it is you wanted to originally do. 
Uh, yeah, uh, as said, you are in at the moment in three totally different time zones. Is it uh, Oakland, New York, and London, right? So when did this happen, and how have you kind of built your new way to work? And ha have you found some new ways for this album? And how have you like figured it out? Well, we've been doing it this way from the start. Even when we were living in the same town, we were. Uh, working on we even the first album was was even though it came out of jams that we did in person all the all the production and most of the composition uh, was done remotely so we've been doing it this way for a long time and then uh, when Jan went back to London we were kind of already seasoned at this process and it's just been uh, getting better from there. And then when uh, Ryan only recently left the Bay Area, so this is, you know, this uh, three different time zones thing has only been for the past year, which I think at that point, the album was, Nell's was almost done by that point. So, um, and I go back and forth between the East and West Coast all, all the time. So we're really just like this global band <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Yeah, we were joking the other day that this gives us more more coverage because you know, like Layla now can pass it to me, and I have three more hours to work on it, and then I can pass it to Jan, and he has five more hours after that, so we can keep the <laughs> keep the ball rolling a little bit more now. We just need to open an Asia office, then we're all set. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, global global twenty four seven coverage. <laughs> yeah, since uh, well, all scenes are pretty quiet at the moment i'm all, always interested like uh back back in the day when you were still in the same city how was the music scene in san francisco in 2012 and how did your band then fit in there that time well i mean the bay area just has a huge underground music scene uh that's that's been there for as long as i know and it's it's still here um and it we we were sort of like i think it was kind of challenging to find a niche for us in the in the underground music scene here because we were like we're pretty different from a lot of the stuff that's that's happening it's like we weren't we weren't really like we're not noise um so you know playing a noise show we would play noise shows but we, we didn't really quite fit in with that um, you know, and so we ended up just and uh, playing on all these bills, like these very, very strange, like like all metal bills, or or noise shows, or um, I don't know, just just because we don't really fit in one specific genre, we're like we kind of fit in with all of them at the same time. I don't know, it was it was uh, it was challenging, but I think uh, after a while, you know, everybody. Um, everybody here got to know all of us, and I, I think it got um, a little easier. But but yeah, it's just it's just sort of like the plight of of the band that doesn't really have a um, particular uh, scene or you know just like cookie cutter kind of identity that uh, you know we kind of we kind of don't fit in, and we we do all at the same time. And so it was interesting yeah, I mean, playing shows because we we would kind of stand out a lot of times and like some people thought that was great and some people didn't like it as much but i think i i think it's kind of cool when you're kind of the band that doesn't necessarily sound like like the other bands on the bill yeah because during our time playing i mean it was only a handful of shows before i unfortunately left the city but we did what like metal shows in the warehouse in oakland we did kind of trendy friday night bars in the city you guys did a 24 hour ambient show in a church, didn't you? Like we, oh. we've covered some bases. Yeah, we did. Yeah, our first show was with like a power metal band and uh, like doom metal and black metal and then us. <laughs> and we ended up playing a lot of metal shows, I think, you know, because Layla is obviously, you know, pretty well known and connected in, in that community. Um, but it was always interesting to to play a metal show. I mean, I I definitely think you know some like the, with drone and doom and stuff. There's some there's some parts, especially with our earlier stuff, where there's a quite a bit of overlap. And we'd kind of tailor our set a little bit. Like if we're playing, you know, we played this weird twenty like twenty four hour ambient. 
we didn't play 24 hours. The show went 24 hours. We played like 45 minutes of it, but we would sort of, you know, change our approach to how we would play live. So we would kind of slot in a little bit more, like a little more improv, a little more ambient, or for like the metal shows, we would kind of dial up the noise and the kind of the thunder a little bit more in the music a little bit. So we would, which was fun for us. So we'd be you know, still playing us and sounding like us, but kind of like, kind of moving around a little bit um, within sort of the the realms the, of our songs. It, it was, yeah, it was fun. They're fun shows. Yeah, we like to test the subwoofers. <laughs> <laughs> Just max them out. Yeah, you said that this, uh like uh, living so far away from each other it's a pretty recent thing so is there gonna be some uh, live of course maybe not at this time but uh, like how far away dreams are I have for concerts for you well I I think it can happen especially since Ryan's in New York and I I'm in the New York area quite a bit uh, and New York isn't too uh, long of a flight for Jan, I think, you know, maybe some New York City shows would be the way to go at first. Um, you know, we're, we're connected with some folks there. So that could happen. Uh, also, uh, Ryan does like a quarterly online um, sort of experimental night um, that was sort of part of this collective in, in Oakland called Super Void. I don't know, Ryan, is that still like we're trying to keep it, we're trying to stay motivated to keep it going online. I mean, we had like a couple of shows in person and then, you know, COVID hit. And so we're doing it online and it's just been decreasingly difficult to want to, you know, as I'm sure you are all experiencing to, pl to you know, attend live shows. It's getting harder and harder to keep interested as well as playing live shows online. Um, like Jan and I played and we're one of our projects we, on, on the day after Christmas. And it's so weird because we're like sitting in Jan's living room in London and just kind of playing, but then somehow people are watching. So it's been, yeah, I mean, it's, I definitely, I really miss, you know, going to shows like everybody does and I miss playing shows. And so I think it's certainly something that um, we're interested in doing. And Leo, I mean, it's not that far of a flight between here and London for, for Jan to come over or for us to go over there and play shows. And like Jan, plays, you know, plays out quite a bit with his, his solo project and his bands in London. And, you know, I just, just moved here and I'm, you know, really excited to kind of get involved with the, with the community here. So, and then, you know, we have the community in back in the Bay area. So we have some, some strong connections in a bunch of different places now. So I think it'll be fun to, to kind of think about how, how we could do that live and also how to do it live without the capability of having a lot of practice together right <laughs> so that's another part of the of which makes it difficult for playing shows but you know we've done it before and we can certainly certainly do it again i think it'll be fun yeah you also had a video for take its course uh and i saw some like uh, you use of course visuals in your concerts too so uh how important are those visuals for you i mean how closely are they intertwined with your music is it like an extension for music or how do you feel? I guess, I mean, I did the video for Take It's Course and it was very much kind of that same idea of something that's not quite real. You can't quite make out what it is exactly. It's sort of, I don't know, it's got an atmosphere and an unrealness to it. And I just thought that that kind of mixed well with the song. Um, and so, I mean, visually, that's that's kind of where I feel feel things sit uh we've had a few other videos and they they go along like similar lines even though they're done by different people so i, I don't know i kind of like to think the music inspires that regardless of who's doing the video yeah jan's our visual director he he's done all our own covers <laughs> and so all that imagery is like it's definitely, it definitely comes from the music and it's all stuff that, that he films himself. It's not like, I, I don't think it's found footage. I think some of it is like stuff you grew in your lab. <laughs> yeah. It's all like practical grown things or, you know, things disintegrating or moving slowly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, just the nature of the music lends itself to some really interesting abstract imagery that kind of parallels, um, parallels the music and i mean for most of the time when we play live shows we'll also we'll play with video also um 
from yeah and we've had various you know various people do help us out and make some really great videos for for playing for playing live but yeah i think the two are are pretty closely interwoven just because I, I feel like kind of stylistically and tonally there there's a nice integration between the two and i think the theme of the vocals as well i mean leila correct me if i'm wrong but it's quite sort of abstract and you know it's i don't want to say ethereal but like you know it doesn't it's not locked in on a specific theme or something happened to someone and this is how they feel about it yeah, I mean, maybe the origin came from something specific, but I'm definitely not trying to express express something uh, concrete. <laughs> so um, I'm more just trying to evoke a feeling, and I think I think the visuals are very much connected with um, sort of uh, the intimacy that the vocals evoke um, through, you know, tonally, melodically. Um, you know, the words are definitely intended to make you feel a certain something, um, even though they're, they might not be linked with a specific, uh, I'm not trying to like dictate a certain event, but, um, I'm sure something real happened to me that <laughs> <laughs> caused it to be written that way. But yeah, I try not to be too, too specific. <laughs> yeah. I hope trophallaxis didn't happen to you. <laughs> oh yeah it was about like carbon dioxide or something or like i don't even remember it's it like was. shared shared feeding behavior it was a That's word that it. i learned yeah re re reading for randomly for work i had to learn about termites um and yeah it's like a shared shared feeding i believe so <laughs> so i mean if you're into that that's cool but yeah probably probably didn't actually happen <laughs> <laughs> you are active in the <clears throat> all active in the music scenes around you so uh have you seen some kind of uh effects that this time has had to the music scene or uh how do you think this time will affect the music industry and like your sphere of things I don't know, I think online shows are really like what's happening now. And I think that's, I think that's going to continue even, even as things start to open up. Um, beyond that, I'm not so sure, but most people I know are really just focused on recording. Uh, there's, there's a producer here in the Bay Area who figured out how to record bands um, at, uh, at a venue that, is renting out their space to him and he's just positioning everyone you know far away um so everybody could just be be in the same room because if you're working with an engineer i mean we're lucky we we engineer everything ourselves uh but if you're hiring an engineer it's like really hard to um you know send feedback back and forth through email it just gets something gets lost in the translation. And so um, anyway, that, that's just something that's happening here. Um, people are figuring how to adapt without being super close together. And what that means for, for like big live shows, I don't know, but, but I think people are going to figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I definitely worry about venues a lot. Um, I mean, especially the kind of places, you know, that, that we go to shows and that we play kind of these small independent, you know, the do weirder music. Uh, I worry how many of them are going to make it through this. I mean, the Bay Area was not doing great in the music scene anyway, just because cost of living there has just exploded over the last 10 years. Um, I mean, and here, here, I'm not sure. I just, that's the main thing that I'm worried about is when this is over, I think there's going to be a huge hunger for people who are super excited to go out and see live music every, every night and start playing shows. So I think there's going to be this massive rebound of interest I just hope that there are still, you know, places to play it. Um, and I think, you know, if there's not, I think new places kind of will will come back to to fill that because there there certainly is a, a desire for that. If anything, this has taught us how much we, you know, how much we miss it and how much we need it. I think so. I think that, that that's kind of interesting. But I definitely worry, yeah, what kind of impact that's going to have. I mean, it's been interesting too. Some people, and I've gone, I like everybody, you know, ups and downs. Like there's been parts of this last year where I've been super. You know, I've done a ton of work, and then there's been months where I just don't have any creative energy because you're just so 
you know, depressed about, <laughs> about being locked up all the time. And so I think, you know, everyone has had those types of experience. And so I think there's a lot of interesting music that's happening right now, but I think also it's going to be interesting to see what this output feels like compared to the output from the next year when, you know, we're back in being able to see our friends and see performances again and like how that's going to change kind of our outlook and, and our, you know, attitude and how that's going to be reflected in what we're all writing again too. So I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's unprecedented in so many ways. It's hard to predict what's going to happen. Yeah. I can't really add much to that. I mean, I definitely am I'm one of those people that feel like we've been so repressed for the last year and we probably will be for another six months or so at least. And like, that's just taken a massive creative toll on so many people. But like Ryan says, there's just going to be an explosion of people that just want to go out, listen to music, touch everybody. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> 